Good morning to the middle of the African bush for a live safari. Join myself and the rest of the Safari Live crew for another tough day in the office on Safari Live. Morning, 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 and it is the Sunrise Safari here in South Africa. My name is Brent Yo Smith, and I have Dangerous Day of the Objectified Dish on camera. And we are very excited to take you on this beautiful, beautiful morning to explore the wonders of the African wildlife. Now, this morning we do have a new presenter trying out. His name is Adam, and Brian is going to be looking after him, making sure he doesn't get lost. And of course, Herbie is out on foot somewhere, wandering, tracking the big cats. Hopefully he has some success. And remember, this is live. So you're seeing the wonders of Africa at the same time as me. And of course, if you would like to ask me any questions, feel free. Uh, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or uh, use the email address, questions at wildearth.tv. Dave is looking very confused this morning. I'm not sure why. Dave, why are you looking confused this morning? No, no, he's okay. Okay, so we're on the southern edge of our traverse area. And uh, when we are doing the southern boundary patrol, it means we are looking for a cat who's a very big favorite to most of our viewers. Uh, she is the dominant female leopard on Juma. Her name is Karula. And she's got two cubs at the moment. I haven't seen them for about a week, so I really want to catch up with them. I know they had an altercation with some chakma baboons a couple of days ago. But so far, they've been sticking to the south of us. And uh, fingers crossed, they come back for a visit to the north. So I'm going very slowly down the road, checking for tracks. So, no tracks just yet. And uh, a very, a very good morning to Debbie in Vancouver, where it's probably a bit chillier than we are. And Debbie says it is wonderful to listen to the bush wake up. Now, I actually heard a bird that we don't see too often. I think we've only put it on camera once. But unfortunately, it was quite far to the south, but a very interesting bird nonetheless. Um, it's got a call. He goes, Victor, Victor, Victor. And it is, of course, the greater honey guide. And uh, hopefully, we will be able to see one. I'm hoping it's going to move through the day. Uh, don't worry, Dave. Uh, it is a bush that is making that knocking noise, and we have spares on their way. Uh, there's a knocking in my back right tire. I'm aware of it. It's not, not going to stop us taking you on an amazing safari. Don't worry. It is just a bit of wear and tear on the vehicles, which happens uh, with the amount of time we spend following animals off the roads. Okay, so and that greater honey guide, I'll show you a picture of him. And uh, we went. Now, of course, this is the honey guide species in this area that leads not only human beings, but also honey badgers to bee nests and there's a lots of wonderful cultural stories about that so if you are walking through the bush and the honey guide finds you and you decide to follow him and you raid the bird's nest you have to leave a section of the cones and honey and uh, the reason being that's obviously payment for the bird who has led you to this glorious honey but if you don't, and you're a selfish, the next time the honey guard leads you to a bee's nest or a beehive, it's going to lead you either to a black mamba or a man-eating lion. Now, of course, the honey guards don't actually eat the honey. What they're after is the larvae of the bees. That's their favorite food. Let me just find it here quickly. 
Uh, and there is the greater honey guide. And I'm surprised we don't see more of them in this area. Just give me one second, I can play you the call. Victor, Victor. And there we go, the greater honey guide. Whoops, oh, I'm very good at breaking things this, this, this cycle it seems. But we're gonna carry on looking for leopards. And hopefully we're gonna find some tracks shortly. I do love being the first out and the first on the roads. It means we have a lovely blank canvas to work, work with and no one has driven over the tracks I'm trying to follow. Now I know Herbie's looking for the Inkahuma pride. Hopefully, he's gonna have some success. They were roaring and I'm sure a lot of you who watch and listen to the Juma Dam Cam uh, will have heard the Inkahumas. They weren't far from Galago Camp uh, where we left them last night and it seems like they didn't move too far from there. They did have nice full bellies. So no need to be overly active when you're digesting uh, a belly full of meat. Now, after some of uh, the smells that we experienced around the Inkahuma Pride last night, I'm quite happy to go look for a leopard. My eyes were watering at one stage uh, after that one lioness deposited a very large pile of feces right next to the car. Morning, Mike in Florida, and Mike is wondering if we can go past the pale morph Warburg's eagle uh, nest this morning. Mike, I haven't uh, seen them on that nest yet, and I've driven past it every day but I'm sure I will meander through that area at some point this morning. Now there's a couple, there's about four different Warburg's Eagles nests I know about uh, in our Travis area and I've been going past all of them and so far only that one sighting of a Warburg's from James but they should be coming uh, and we should start seeing quite a lot of them in the next month or so. Now of course I am hoping we are able to find I think it's probably the rare, most rare eagle we've put on camera here. And who was with me the other morning? I think it was Viam uh, when we found uh, a pale morph booted eagle actually on this very road. And so I'm hoping that we get another visual of that in a bit better light and I can snap a nice picture because my picture was a bit overexposed just because of where it was sitting. Now, not a common species. Uh, in this area. They're very nomadic, so they can pop up all over Southern Africa, uh, but you never sort of see them in great numbers, the booted eagles. Okay, so now, yesterday I heard monkeys alarm calling just to the south here, and I'm 85% sure they were alarming at Karula, so uh, this is the area I'm most confident that uh, she is going to pop up in. So let's pop the gear into neutral and turn the engine off and idle down the road in stealth mode. Now also, uh, about to appear on the eastern horizon, I think, how long do you think, Dave? Ooh, I don't know, I think it might be less than a minute before we see the golden sheen of uh, the rising sun pop over the eastern horizon. Now it's about 13 degrees Celsius, which is 56 Fahrenheit. So it is definitely getting warmer. Not quite shorts weather just yet, but I think by the time I get back from leave, it'll definitely be shorts weather. And wasn't yesterday exciting? Not only was it the Killer Bee Day, it was also the first ever live broadcast for Safari Live from the Maasai Mara with Commander Bond. And I uh, know you guys got to see some incredible sightings there of wildebeest crossing the Mara River. And as James aptly named some of those crocodiles, uh, they're not crocodiles, they're Tyrannosaurus rexes. 
Now, those crocodiles are absolutely fascinating because the majority of them, the big ones, will only eat once a year during the Mara crossing. Uh, and they will gorge themselves and then they will literally sunbathe for the rest of the year. So very, very fascinating and amazing that we're able to explore a new ecosystem as well. Well, Donna is wondering how many birds we eventually got to. I think we got to about 38 or 39, Donna. Uh, I think uh, the crocodiles in the, in the Mara River put a bit of dampener on our birding, but uh, completely acceptable. Uh, and uh, we also got a bit sidetracked by finding the Inkahuma pride. But one of these days we're going to do a 50 in a, in a day or even better, a 50 in a morning, I think when summer's in full swing and we've got a lot of our migrant species here, it's going to be very exciting. Okay, come on, Karula tracks. This is where I think she might have crossed. So, while I'm looking for tracks, Dave is scanning about, hoping to spot the queen herself. Do you see something, Dave? Oh, not yet, okay. Just checking that you're awake. Okay. Oh, we have baboon tracks. Now I'm thinking about heading to Cheetah Plains this morning because I had a dream about cheetah last night. Now, sometimes that's a good omen. I've had a couple of dreams about wild dogs and then that morning we've seen them. So, why did you guys let me know? Do you think my dream about cheetahs is worth having a dash down to Cheetah Plains uh, and seeing if those cheetah are around? Uh, let me know, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send us an email, questions at wildearth.tv. Okay, so no sign of the Queen crossing yet, and I'll wait patiently to hear whether you think I should follow my dreams, as Kirsten in Final Control says. Uh, but without further ado, let's go meet Adam for the first time. Hello everyone, my name is Adam. I'm uh, new to here, I'm just giving it a test out. My cameraman is Brian with the good old thumb. Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Don't be too harsh on me, I'm new at this. I'm giving it a test for the first time. Over here we have the, what's the name again called Brian? Nkuhumas. On the left of us, I know it's amber because it's very easily recognizable by our eyes. Well, the eyes are shut at the moment. But she's there and the one male face down in the bushes passed out and more down to the right is the rest of the babies and the rest of the family. They reckon the temperature is about 13 degrees, but I don't always believe them because it's the weatherman's one job you can keep, get wrong and still keep it. And she's looking at us, uh, the amber's awake now. Should we crash? Crash while the babies are all playing down in the bushes there. Let's give it a shot. Sorry, boy. Don't mean to wake you up from your sleep. Shame. I know how rude it is to be waking up with noise like this. What a beautiful sunrise in the African bush.
One of the females playing with the little baby there. Game. Thank you, viewers. Well, nice to meet you all. Babies are a lot more lively than they were yesterday after being full of buffalo. Obviously, a lot of it's digested. Except for the one baby lying there. His little fluff ball doesn't look like he really wants to do much. I'm originally from Natal, down in uh, Zululand in Natal. I've been guiding in another game reserve called Tlui Umfalozi Game Reserve. Um, Brian is my friend and he, he gave me this option. He told me about it the other day. Come give it a shot. So now I'm up here trying to see how it goes and see what happens. We want me to move forward for the female there, Brian. Get around. <laughs> She's sharpening her claws on the trees and stuff, so it's nice to see. And she's coming back to the little ones there. Their stomachs are a lot smaller than they were yesterday, that's for sure. Oh, it looks like a bit of bath time, cleaning the babies. Teamwork. Those cute little fluff balls. There comes another one come running in. Because stalking, practicing their stalking, because they'll need that when they're older. Obviously, it looks like bigger ones picking on the smaller ones. Bullying at its best, but it's all good practice. One's got a little stick there. Love the sounds the little cubs make. It's very cute. You can hear the mother calling to little chirps. Hi there, Michael. Well, my favorite part would obviously be the animals. I've always been into animals. If originally I thought I wanted to be a farmer. I went to a farming high school, gave it a chance, and then uh, yeah, I didn't, wasn't so keen on that idea afterwards. And then this came up, and I've been doing it for about 13 so years now, and I've never looked back. I'm, it's always exciting when you get to a site like this. That little rush you get coming out here always gets me. I don't think I could get quite bored of this. This is my office and beats the cement jungle. Can you see it right there, Brian, the mother there? At the back there is one stalking, look there. He's found something that he's stalking. Oh, there's another baby there. It's hiding behind the bushes there. He's going to pounce on the other guy. There we go. <laughs> the kill's done. Oh, here comes the male. They're all very wary, but a little wary of him. But he was playing with it a little bit. Oh, we're all on the move here. Is still sleeping by the road. Oh, 
spot is he going to send more? No. Thought he was going to scent mark there where he's swinging the tree. Normally the males are scent mark on the trees and the scent can last for about 48 hours. There, yeah, wait, he might do it down there. He's going and rubbing on the bush. Let's see if he's... There we go. Marking his territory. The scent will last about 48 hours around. I wonder where they're off to on a mission. Early morning walk with the sun coming up. Okay, well, back to Brent. Let's see what he's up to. Well, we're still cruising slowly to the east. We've got tracks of one male lion heading due east. Uh, look very fresh, he's been scent marking right here, and I know you've just seen scent marking male lion with Adam. I'm just going to make sure where he goes. Oh, there he goes. Dook -a -dook -a -dook -a -dook -a -dook. Maybe we'll catch up with him. Now, of course, male lions are capable of walking vast distances. Uh, probably up to about 25 kilometers in an evening. And uh, a funny story about that is that uh, my dad has always been a bushman uh, from a young age. Apparently, uh, one of the biggest problems was when his clothes went into the washing, it was full of bones and feathers and insects and, and things like that. And he met my mother, who was an international tennis player. In fact, she lived in Boston and she's South African but lived in Boston and on their honeymoon was their first real proper bush trip up Africa into northern Botswana and they'd been doing the fancy honeymoon thing in the nice hotels on the beach and stuff before that and the rest of the honeymoon was in a tiny two-man tent and on their first night they were at a magnificent spot called Naipans which is famous for its lions and uh, they went on a game drive, they saw some lions, saw some elephants, cooking over the fire, tiny little A-frame two-man tent, and uh, a lion starts roaring in the distance. Now, normally you know I do my lion roar with great gusto, but I'm recovering from a bit of man flu, so not quite as gusto-y as normal, so... Mm. 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 And they just got into bed. I'm just going to let this car go past me. Is it then, Gailan Gonzo? Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Morning, morning. How's everyone doing? Morning. Very good. Good, thanks. Where in Koro? In Koro. Yeah. Okay, sharp. <laughs> I'm going to go check for Shikankang. Yeah, maybe. I had a dream about Cheetah last night, so today's the day. <laughs> I'll call you, don't worry, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, just a morning meeting. Um, so this lion track we're following has been found, unfortunately, to the north of our traverse area. So my mother taps my father and says, Kevin, Kevin, how far is that lion, right? I just, oh, I don't know. Five or six k's. Silence for 20 minutes. Kevin, Kevin, how far can a male lion walk at night? Oh, I don't know, 25 k's. That's it, mom, out the tent, sleeping in the, in, in, in the four by four. Um, strangely enough, now she takes her cell phone game drive and is often found sitting with lions all by herself. So very, very funny how things change. And an uh, interesting thing about my mother, she is the highest ranked African woman tennis player ever. Um, she was, when she retired, at the ripe old age of 23, uh, she was ranked number four in the world. And one of her last games, she thrashed Chris Evert, 6-1, 6-2 in Chris Evert's hometown.
sorry, it'd be on the radio for a second. Uh, Texas Inca Umas on Gallagher Shortcut. Um, just, uh, we've got an interviewee in there, so he might not be on the radio, but you should be able to see him from the road, the whole pride. Okay, sorry about that. And uh, thank you very much, Photo Nikki. Uh, Photo Nikki says, uh, I love the story, stories about your parents. Says, I'm very lucky uh, to have adventurous parents that have uh, taken us on many adventures. And so uh, we're going to head now down onto Cheetah Plains. So while we do that, let's go back to the incredible in Kahumas. Yeah, we're still here with the lions. It's, they're slowly starting to move off into the riverine Donga area. But the babies are still having a, a whale of a time. You can see there's one on an angry elephant tree there. And they're just having a bash out there playing. But yeah, they're starting to move. Where's the one? We're still missing amber and one male. I actually don't see them. I don't know where they're gone. I don't see them behind us anymore. The rest, the, most of them have gone into the, the riverine area. Why are we here? Hey, I'm not getting out to the line, don't worry. This tree. Just doing something here. The trees, kind of the trees to the left and right of us, is called a a magic quarry. You see, it's quite recognizable by its, its wavy leaves. Its scientific name, Euclid's Divinorum, you know, the one they divine for water. Not that I, I've never tried that. I don't quite 100% believe that. Very good for fire beaters. You've got a fire, a fire in your reserve, and you you worried. Uh, well, you don't have enough. Um, five beaters and you've got a whole bunch of guys just break these branches off and you go for it they don't fall apart easily if you were stuck in the bush also and you needed a toothbrush there we go there's a toothbrush that you can use for the bush toothpaste you take the white ash from a fire especially from a hardwood leadwood ironwood they make good they make your teeth not uh, nice and clean that's why bushmans have such white teeth uh, don't use the white ash from a, um, a soft tree it'll end up damaging your teeth which you don't want just a little tree knowledge thing <laughs> well most of them are all gone down into the they've gone into the riverine i don't see the male no she's still amber's still behind us let's go there she's still sitting on the road Asking my, which is my big favorite cat, obviously lions. Oh, actually, I'm not too sure. They're actually all really cool in their own special way. Leopards, because you hardly ever see them, so it's always uh, amazing when you get to see them. Right now, with males and babies and females all here, it's kind of hard to beat that. So, it's a hard question. And then you've got the cheetah, which is very rarely seen, also. So, hmm, all three, I'd say. Even the little guys that you don't see around are also very cool. He's watching us there. Shane, look at all, all the scars and all the sun is going. And the amber wants us to go any further. Oh, the sun, just in the wrong spot for the male. I'm just looking at all the 
All the guys in the mail. Let me try to go for a little bit next to Amber. She has the most amazing eyes. No. That one's it too. Here. You can hear some hyenas in the background to the direction where the where the, the rest of the lines have gone. What is this? Yeah, oh, behind us. I think Amber can hear them too. Yeah, she can hear them. Obviously, our hyenas and lions are not the best of buddies. But I have watched a video clip of uh, one lioness that she'd caught an impala. She was all by herself, and then one hyena arrived there, and he also wanted some. They started fighting, and then they actually just lay down and started eating on each side of the impala, and that's where it stopped. And then they found out that the lioness was actually pregnant. So that's why they kind of made a truce, and they just stayed there and ate half-half. Something amazing which you hardly ever see. Obviously the lioness didn't want to risk any injury to herself and her unborn baby there. Oh, these ones are in such amazing condition. Yeah, she's The sun on the wrong side of you there. The male, I think, is looking for the rest of the family or looking for the hyenas that we're calling. Hi there, James Richard. Question from you. Which animal would I sit for an hour with? Yo, that, that's also a very hard question. Some of one that I like to sit, sit a lot with is obviously elephants, because lions are, can be very cool, but after a while, they don't, as you see, they're not doing very much. I mean, it was nice to watch the babies playing. That's amazing. But like you see, these two guys are just, they're just chilled and relaxing. Elephants are always very busy and moving around and doing stuff, uh, the family of elephants. And, if you are lucky enough to catch them by the water, you can sit there for ages and watch them because they're like little kids in playgrounds. So that's that I'd say is sitting with elephants. Oh, there comes a little game drive vehicle in front of us. Uh, there's Shanson, you're asking about any close call guiding experiences. Um, yes, I do have. I've been chased lots of times by elephants, obviously. I have been hit twice in a car by a rhino, which was got the blood pumping. I uh, didn't see the one rhino in the bush while I was going down the road, and he just came out the side and hit me on the side. And the other one was a male that uh, He'd been fighting with another male, and I didn't know that. And I arrived there, and obviously he arrived with a really grumpy rhino. So he hit me, and I quickly raced away from that situation after that. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to hang around after he told me to leave. Are you going to get up and join the rest of your crew? Oh, I love those eyes. She's enjoying the sun in her face. It has a nice little dreamy look. The male is now, he's uh, obviously heading to join the rest of his, his gang. Oh, he's calling. Wow, oh, little watch of sound. Don't want to 
would start the engine to roll back. And it was... Welcome to Africa. sound travels over quite a distance he's obviously talking to his his brother that's gone missioning down with the lens you don't want to move her amber you're quite happy here i think she's enjoying the sun in her face there after a cold night Going through some of these dips, it's quite fresh. Uh, yeah. Falling asleep. On the lion's face, the, the whiskers patches, the little spots by the whiskers, it's unique to each lion. If you get a close photo, you can identify them by that. Obviously, her is her eyes but all the other lines you can take it by the whiskers patches. There he is. Okay, well, we're going uh, back to Brent for a, see how, how things are going with his side. Well, we are now way down east, and you can see the beautiful light coming from the eastern horizon. And uh, hopefully my dreams come true today and we find some cheetah. Unfortunately, the Styx Pride, and it sounds like Birmingham's, are on a buffalo kill to the north of us. Jenny! Jenny set the, the bar quite high. Jenny would like to know, when am I going to find a baby cheetah? Well, Jenny, hopefully today. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about being live in the bush, you never know. But if I have to be honest, of all of us who's most likely to find a baby cheetah in the next uh, 10 days or so, I'm going to have to say, James has got the best chance in the Mara Triangle. So, uh, but hopefully, maybe we can beat him out here. So the interesting thing about cheetah, is uh, they don't have very set territories like a lion and leopard. Uh, the males will have a very large home range, generally up to about 120,000. Oh, sidestrap jackal. feeding off the remains of that buffalo carcass. Oh, off the jog, let's see if we can get another view. Um, well, we'll get back to the cheetah shortly. Let's concentrate on our little jackal friends. Through the gap, to the left, there. Look at that. They are just so gorgeous. I do love my canids. Oh, stop behind the dead tree. Let's get a little bit closer. So this is one of the two pairs we see regularly on cheetah plains. The other is down in the south. disappearing into the bush. Well, there we go. That's a nice start to our cheetah plane safari. Maybe when we come back here, they'll be back on that buffalo carcass and we can sneak in. Okay, so, as, as I was saying about cheetah, so the males have a massive home range, around 120,000 acres. And uh, within that home range, there are generally a couple of females. Now, 
the females don't really stick to an area. The only time females stay in an area uh, regularly uh, is when they have cubs. So I've only seen female tracks once or twice uh, in up here in the north, but that doesn't mean it could change. Uh, they, might not, they might appear today, and especially with these dry conditions and the water that we've got in the, in the, in the eastern Sabi sands, we could easily get some female cheetah through. And I have seen female cheetah tracks on cheetah plains uh, and on Juma, strangely enough, but we haven't managed to see that female yet. Now, cheetahs are absolutely fascinating because they are the only member of the big cat, uh, big cat fraternity or big cat families that need uh, a male dominant number. What have we got flying over? Ah, blacksmith lapwings. Oh, they're going to keep. Here we go. Off they fly. Okay, so as I said, so it's the only only member of the, the all the big cats where there have to be more males than females, and a female cheetah will often pass up on three or four coalitions uh, before she mates. Now this is very unusual, and it is one of the reasons why cheetahs are quite often under threat, um, apart from also being over specialised. But it is a very very unique. Uh, thing and it's exclusive to cheetahs in, in terms of the cat family. All the other cats, you'll have a male who has multiple females within his territory. Female cheetah need multiple males. So to stimulate their Easter cycle, they literally need to turn down males, which is, I find, incredibly interesting. Okay, we're coming up towards three in a row pan. Maybe our Friendly Mr. Quarantine will be around. So James Richard said he read that, oh look what's coming through this glorious morning light. I think they are heading towards the water. Let's have a look. Kicking up some, no they're heading away from the water. Darn it. There are some elephants. And just make them out. Okay, well, I think I know where they're going to come out. Let's just keep checking because they are heading away from the water. We missed the morning drink. Darn it. And we'll have to catch the next morning drink at the next pan. So, James Richard said he read that baby cheetah have retractable claws. Uh, they have semi retractable claws, even in adults uh, and, and as well as in babies. They're not truly retractable. Um, and the reason that they don't have fully retractable claws is because of the high speeds they reach. They need those claws for a bit more stability um, when they are maneuvering at over 100 kilometers an hour. <coughs> okay, so we missed the elephant's morning drink or that particular herd. I'm hoping we're going to catch some more ellies, and this area is going to be inundated with elephants at the moment uh, due to the lack of water in the western Kruger. And you can see they've almost finished this pan. Hi, Michael. Michael's 18 and uh, one of our favorite regular viewers. And Michael would like to know, what do I think the best animal to take pictures of? Well, Michael, the animal that's in front of you would be my answer. Um, all different animals have uh, different bonuses about taking pictures. Of course, the big cats are incredibly special. Uh, lion, leopard, and cheetah all give often absolutely fantastic photographic opportunities. What is that up there? Let me just go forward a little bit. Oh, no, it's, it's just a hornbill. And I don't know, for me personally, I do like taking photos of leopards, but then again, it also depends on the leopard. Um, but also lion cubs, how can you beat lion cubs? Uh, and also like taking pictures of birds. 
also do quite a bit of photography of flowers and insects. So I think the best is not to confine yourself to any particular thing uh, and rather just enjoy all of nature. Hi, uh, Joey, who's in Australia. Now, Joey would like to know, and it's a very good question, Joey, uh, whether there's a better chance of brown hyena on cheetah plains uh, than on Juma. I would say so, Joey, uh, just because we're on the Kruger boundary and there's lack of water there. Now, brown hyenas are not water dependent. And uh, now, a very interesting fact about brown hyenas uh, when the Kruger was originally formed, there were more brown hyenas than spotted hyenas. That is not the case now. And in a lot of areas, brown hyenas have been completely uh, or become locally extinct in those areas. They are slowly moving back, though, which is quite interesting. Um, where my parents live, not far from here, we've got actually two different brown hyena dens, as well as two spotted hyena dens, as well as two wild dog dens. So doing quite well on that front at the moment at home, and I'm quite excited to go see those wild dog puppies in a few days. Um, so, now, the Kruger, uh, completely innocently at the time, thought it would be better for the wildlife if they created water holes all over the Kruger in areas where there wouldn't be permanent water. Uh, what this actually did was is really sort of, to a degree, messed up a lot of the ecosystem. Now, they're, they're busy working to change it at the moment. So they've closed a lot of the water holes. Uh, and the main reason that it really caused a bit of havoc there. So animals like brown hyena, sable, and roan, uh, all not very dependent on water, but also very dependent on low numbers of spotted hyenas and lions. Now, what happened is, generally during the summer months, when it rains and all the pans fill up, uh, with the hyena and stuff like that. The lions and hyena would migrate in and out of those areas, um, but the lion densities in those areas far away from permanent water would always be, be lower, and so would the spotted hyena uh, densities. So with these pumped water holes being all over, it created the opportunity for these, uh, the other two bigger predators, the spotted hyena and the lions, to be permanently based, and the prides and clans got bigger in those areas, and they basically outcompeted the brown hyena. Now, a similar thing happened with the sable and roan. Now, oh, hello, zebra. That one almost looked like it was doing perfect passage. It was a dressage maneuver, but it stopped now. Okay, zebra. And so, let's just... I think we're going to find some more zebras out in the open, just up ahead, so we'll keep moving. Um, and we just finish up on the, the water holes in the Kruger. So what happened was now, because those permanent water holes were there, bulk grazers like buffalo and zebra, who would have traditionally migrated into these areas during the summer months when the, when the pans were full, and then as soon as they dried, they would have moved back to the rivers and the permanent water. Uh, and that left those areas without too many bulk grazers permanently in the area. So, for example, in Kruger, uh, the sable antelope, 80% of its diet consists of one species of Aerogrostis or lovegrass, Aerogrostis cavella. And uh, sable is one of the, sable and roan are two of the few antelope. Most antelope prefer short grass, they don't. They like long grass, but if you've got a bulk grazer that's coming through, it's absolutely wiping those grasses to next to nothing. And if there's water there, those bulk grazers are there permanently throughout the year. And, and basically, that caused the sable roan populations to absolutely crash. Now, to try to recover um, the sable and roan uh, populations, the Kruger has actually closed water holes. It's trying to get back to the most uh, natural system possible. But the, the one problem with um, human beings is the moment we start fiddling, we can't stop, and the garden is in Eden. But I think it's, Kruger does an absolutely fantastic job, in my opinion, and I've been to lots of national parks all over the world. 
it's probably the best run national park in, in the world uh, in terms of infrastructure, service, accommodation, uh, everything, uh, the conservation side, the game capture side. It, it is probably the best run national park in the world. And uh, one must remember that most other national parks in the world are not the size of a country. So uh, if I remember, I remember, if I remember correctly, I think the Kruger is um, about the size of Switzerland. So that gives you an idea. But anyway, I'm going to make my way down towards uh, the open plains. Uh, fingers crossed that my dreams will come true. In the meantime, uh, let's go back to Adam and the lions. Now oh, there we are. We left the lions. They all, all got up and headed into the donga at the back there, the riverine area. So we are missioning off to see what other little fun treasures we can find. Kind of hoping for a leopard. It's been a while since I've had a good sighting of that. So I'm not hoping to see that. That would be really cool. But actually, everything's cool. So obviously got a bit of favorites here and there. Let's see. Uh, Hi there, Aaron, asking what my favorite animal is. That will obviously be the elephant. I'm very keen on elephants. As you can see on the side here, we have the, these big, big trees or marula trees. You're talking about elephants. You can see he was digging his trunk into the, the into his tusks into the, the trunk of the marula tree. Uh, just if you, with a bit of culture, the Zulu people believe Oh, this tree has got a lot with fertility. So if uh, you get a male and a female marula tree, obviously the female tree gets the, the fruit around February, and the male tree gets nothing. And when the lady is pregnant, if they take the bark and they crush it up into a powder and the, the lady takes it, depending on what baby she wants, if she wants a male or a female, she chooses the male or female tree, takes the, pot, the bark and, has, and, and she will supposedly have uh, male or female baby, whichever one she chooses to take. If she takes the, 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 pow the bark powder for a male baby and she has a female baby, they believe it's a special baby because it has gone against the, the ancestors and actually had an opposite sex what that she should have had. So it's be a special child. It's a little bit of a Zulu belief. Um, the fruit from the ruler tree, very high in vitamin C, a lot of animals will eat it. The elephants eat the bark, the branches, the fruit, the leaves. We can eat the leaves. I have people say it, it tastes like um, cabbage. I've done a survival thing, staying in the bush. Yeah, it doesn't taste like cabbage. It's really bad, but you can eat it. I've added a lot of salt trying to make it taste better. It didn't work. Uh, there is also stories that the fruit makes elephants drunk. That's a good campfire stories. It doesn't work. The fruit passes through the elephant sometimes very quickly. Some get uh, broken up. Some come out very, come out whole, and you can actually peel the skin off and eat it once it's been through the elephant, and it'll taste fine. If I'm around and we have the fruit around, then I'll show you. I'll do it. On the road, you can see there's some now and again some elephant tracks going down the, on the road. Been doing a morning stroll down the road. Question from Louise, how do I know Brian? That's actually quite, quite funny. I met Brian in uh, 2013. We actually are gamers, we play online games. So I met him around 2013. I met him face to face two days ago, <laughs> but I've known him from 2013. And he, uh, he, when he gave me the option, that's when I came up and that's when I got to meet him for the first time. Because me being down in Zululand, down in Natal, he's been this side, never really been close around him. Some red-billed wood hoopoos calling away. No? Sorry, my bad. Not red-billed wood hoopoos. What's that? There's a magpie. Is that there? 
one at the back. I thought that was a wooden shoe. Sorry about that, I was wrong. Birdie, uh, asking if I have a favorite bird. Yes, I do. I really enjoy the Marshall Eagle, obviously very big and powerful. So I've really gotten to like them a lot. I've watched some very nice sightings of them, of Marshall Eagle catching a baby in parlor, Marshall Eagle trying to catch a darker. So I've had some very good sightings with them, and I really enjoy watching them. So, hi there, Saraya. Asking how many different countries have I guided in? I've only been in South Africa and mainly hanging around Natal. This is the first for me coming up to this side of South Africa, so that's why it's a new adventure if I can get up here, yeah. Sarah asking, when did I discover my love for animals? Oh, that was a long time ago, right when I was a little, little child. Uh, my mom used to breed cats, so I've always liked cats being around animals and be having dogs around, and then it just grew from there into bigger, wilder things after that. I'm just going to carry on around the crab. Oh, it's so dry here. Debbie asking, what about elephants makes them their, my favorite is just, they're very, they're always busy doing something, so you can't get bored watching them. It's like, but I'm, it's, they're, they're especially a family. A male, yeah, he can get a bit boring because he's just by himself eating. But when you've got the whole family of adult females and babies and they're all moving around and doing something and then they eat, they're moving around eating a lot during the day. So, and then they're moving to water. So you can, you can sit with them for quite a few hours and be very entertained with elephants. Well, the elephant was walking down, he's gone that way. Some elephant tracks in the road, but they're heading that way, the way we've come. Okay, well, let's go. We're gonna carry around, see if I'm lucky enough to get a get a leopard. Otherwise, back to Brent's and see what he's looking at. So we are sitting on the southern edge of Cheetah Plains, glassing the large open area. So when I refer to glassing, I mean we are panning. Dave is panning with a camera. I'm panning with my binoculars to see if we can spot something. Now, when looking for cheetah, it's very important to glass carefully. Because often they lie very, very flat, um, and they can look like a log, more so than a lion or a leopard, for me at least. But it is an absolutely gorgeous morning down here, even if there are no cheetah on the plane. It's just a spectacular sight to behold. Not quite. Oh, what's that? Oh, 
I've got a steenbok <laughs> way in the distance. And that's that. Okay, well, let's move to our next glassing point. Now, a very good morning to Justin, who would like to know if I've got any tips on wildlife photography. Now, Justin, most of the, the wildlife photographers I know, uh, none of us have any formal training. Um, the best tip I can give anyone, and uh, it sounds ridiculous, but you would be absolutely flabbergasted to know how many people don't do this, uh, is read your manual. <laughs> I carry the manual with me. If something goes wrong, I can flick through my manual, have a look, try to figure it out. And then the most important thing is, is to play. Because I mean, uh, I shoot on settings that a lot of people wouldn't consider normal settings. I've got presets. I like high ISO um, for black and white. So the most important thing is for me is to first to get to know your camera properly, read the manual. And secondly, is just try everything. And a lot of sort of, um, I don't know how to say this nicely, but hoity-toity photographers, um, and there's quite a lot of them with the hipster brigade around at the moment um, in the world, is uh, like, my goodness, you have to shoot in like manual, otherwise you don't like get the, the best effects. Now, some of the best photographers in the world his photographs sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, what was his name? I think it, not Ansel Adams, he's been dead. Uh, Art Wolf, I think is his name. Um, so there's a, there's a very good reason why a lot of these cameras have automatic functions, uh, and that's because they're better at doing it than you are. Um, especially with wildlife, uh, you don't have, unless you're setting up a, a star shot or, or um, a, a panoramic on a tripod uh, with a lot of animals they're on the move you do not have time to fiddle around manually and I'm not talking manual focus I'm talking about manual settings of your your ISO uh, and all those type of things uh, but you can set presets so like if it gets dark I change to uh, a preset for low light and, I, and, I, and I've figured those presets out over what works for me and what works for me might not work for someone else and uh, so I think it's a very personal thing, and, and the best way is to just try, try everything, play with your camera until you, you're comfortable and confident with what it can do. Well, so far, my dreams are not coming true. Uh, I don't see any cheetah just yet, but I do see Ephraim from Cheetah Plans. So, well, there's a cheetah in the word there, at least on the side of his car. Um, let's see what... F has to say. And we do have some crowned lapwings making noise. So I'm just going to have a quick chat with Ephraim as he comes past. Morning, Imze. Morning. How are you, Imfo? Morning. Morning, everyone. Morning. Yeah, we're live. we're live. Oh, my lights. Yeah, I always forget to turn them off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any luck that side? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Where's in Kanye and Kruger? What? Shikangang? No, the Nyari. Nyari, ah. Ah, oh, Stenbok. Okay, um, there was something love near the, but, but deep in the in the bush near three in a row. Oh, that's right. And that's that's all I've seen so far. You didn't go like along in the boundary. No, not yet. Where are you going to head now? Just go anywhere. Go anywhere. Okay, I'll go anywhere in the opposite direction. <laughs> cool. It, good luck. Enjoy. Okay, so we're back. So. And there seems to be tracks of a large herd of buffalo that crossed into Kruger. That's the only update so far, apart from the noisy lapwings. <coughs> I 
Well, a big welcome to Dizzy Leo, who's a new viewer. Welcome to the Safari Live family. And says, you see cheetahs on here, how cool. I wish we saw them a bit more often, uh, but yes, we do. This is our best area to look for cheetah. That's why we're down here um, in the early morning. Now, the cheetahs are crepuscular hunters, which means they are most active at dusk and dawn. So a good time in the morning to look for cheetahs is, is, is about now. But we're going to see what else we might be able to stumble upon. I'm going to do one big loop through Cheetah Plains, maybe check the water holes one more time. Maybe there'll be some elephants drinking. If no luck, I'll head back to the north and uh, see if we can uh, find anything else on that side. Well, good morning, Melissa. And Melissa would like to know, is there a story behind the lion in my surname? Because my surname is Leo Smith, Ali O hyphen Smith. Um, there is a story, but it's not quite as sexy as uh, what I would like it to be. So uh, my ancestors came to Africa in 1820, uh, one of the first set of uh, British ancestors to move out. And uh, there were quite a few Smiths on the boat. Uh, and we originally actually come from the village of York, uh, is where my ancestors come from. And uh, so we are the Smiths that come from Leopold. So there was there were so many Smiths that came across uh, in the 1820s uh, that uh, our section of Smiths changed their, their name to be different from the other Smiths, of course. Uh, to quote my father, the world is full of normal people, there's enough of them. Uh, and. Uh, so we are the Smiths that come from Leopold, so we are Leo Smith. So that's where it comes from. Not, not quite sexy that in 1820 one of my ancestors fought with a lion barehanded or something. So just, uh, 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 I suppose, to make clerical things in the early days easier. So after arriving in a, what was around Grahamstown, uh, my ancestors headed to the north and uh, set up farms in and around uh, the midlands of KwaZulu-Natal. Now, my great, I think it's three greats, grandmother, uh, was quite a famous marksman. And uh, in the 1800s, uh, she shot a lion in what is now uh, almost Durban city centre as it was trying to eat her horse. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably one of the more interesting ones from uh, that side of the family. So, if there are any people who've been to South Africa, and know where Berea is, or the Musgrave Centre. There's a shopping centre. Um, she shot a lion pretty much where the, the big shopping centre in the city of Durban is now. And it was trying to get into the horse stables. And her husband was off on a trading expedition uh, in Zululand at the time. I reckon the ladies back then must have been really tough. But while we continue to search for lions, and definitely not to shoot them, uh, but to view them, and times have changed. And shoot them with a the camera, exactly, Dave. Uh, let's go see how Adam's exploration of Juma is going. Welcome back. I think I saw, hold on. We're still on the hunt for Nah, it's a lesser spot, a tree stump. <laughs> We're still on the hunt to see if we are lucky enough to spot a leopard out here. Oh, there's a Stenbocki running around the bushes in the back there. Or on the road. Sorry. I'm sorry, it's a dark, it's a darker, it's a grey darker at the back there. Uh, the, the drought is, uh, Debbie, hi there Debbie, asking about uh, the, what's my impression of the drought. It's very bad. Uh, where I come from, we were lucky enough in Natal to have a bit of rain. So in the fluey side of the game reserve is a lot greener than this side. So coming up here, it's very hard sore to see this and drive around and then see these dams that has got nothing in it. So hopefully this raining season 
it, it, it happens that we get something because the dams are looking very bad. There's no grass here. It's very, very sad to see. Me especially coming from where it's been very, it's been almost spring for us because we were lucky enough to get winter rain, which we don't normally get down that side. We normally get summer rain and we were lucky enough to get saved by some winter rain and make it, and the bush just took off. And it, there's uh, trees that are already, like the marula trees by us have started growing their leaves because of the rain that we've had. They're excited. They think it's great because we just haven't been getting rain. There's a grey luri thing. Oh, sorry, I, I call it grey luri because that is the old name. It's the go-away bird, which I, I don't really like. I prefer grey luri. Sounds much nicer. I call it a go-away bird because of supposedly makes it sound go away when the hunters were, were going and missioning around the bushes and they say go away <laughs> so but yeah luri sounds a lot nicer for me chilling on top of a marula tree they lose their leaves in winter so they should we'll get them back in spring <laughs> Oh, it's, it's warming up nicely here now. Like, it's a nice, comfortable temperature, except when the sun is straight in my eyes. I can't see exactly what's happening here. Should be a very nice day, warming up to a good temperature, I'm sure, later. Um, how they dizzy Leo asking what the what I think the prettiest bird in South Africa would be would be a very rare Narina trogon I'm not too sure if they get them up here but by us a Narina trogon down there very rare sighting kind of probably the closest thing we have to a parrot that side I don't know the parrot is a gray-headed parrot this side but down where I'm from it's a Narina trogon if you look it up you'll see a very very pretty bird nice green and yellow um, green and red on it Shall I go straight over, left, right, nah, let's go over. Yeah, this would be lovely if it was full of water here. Yeah. This is very sad to see. Hopefully the rains do come. Everyone keep your fingers crossed. Father Carol asking if I speak any other languages. No, I'm mainly English. I mean, I understand, I say a few words of Zulu or a few words of Afrikaans, but I'm predominantly English. Especially also down that side, it's, you are English and Zulu down that side, but I've mainly been around English people. My parents are originally from Zimbabwe and the grandparents are from from Europe, so yeah, that's, that's why I got mainly English blood. A little important. Okay, we will carry on searching and see what we can find, and let's go back to Brent and see. He's got some in parlors for you. That massive herd of impala, there must be at least 60 or 70 of them, but they're on their way into Kruger and I was secretly hoping that either Inkanyeni or a cheetah would bolt out of the bush and send them scuttering straight towards us. Let's just go a little bit forward. Now, poor impala are often quite an ignored species, even though they are the most, oh no, they're off now the most numerous antelope in Africa. There we go, the last few stragglers crossing into the Kruger. But as I was saying, quite often uh, a species that a lot of time, you don't spend that much time in the safari, you see a lot of them, but you don't actually 
look at them. And if you, if you go a little bit in depth into impala, they're fascinating animals. And uh, out of all the wildlife we see here, they are the most ancient mammal. It's not get involved in reptiles, but mammal. And they've been unchanged for about 1.6 million years. So if you find a fossil impala, it's exactly the same as it is now. And it's an amazing evolutionary adaptation that, sorry, I will be with you in one second. Shanae, Shanae? Shanae, sorry, what was that at Kuru Corner? Gabi, thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, let's go have a quick look there. So uh, that's Shanae. She says there's male leopard tracks coming from Nkoro heading south and uh, parallel to the Kruger boundary. So if he comes out, he's going to come out around here. So let's go have a quick look. Um, but as I was saying about the Impala, I mean, 1.6 million years, they've been exactly the same. And uh, they are incredibly adaptable animals and they inhabit the most varied of uh, of habitats. So they generally prefer a mixed grass, grassland, woodland like we have here in the Sabi Sands. But they do occur onto the fringes of the deserts, um, to the fringes of the high fault, uh, even in certain in valleys in the high fault where there's acacias. Now they are able uh, to browse and graze. So they eat both trees and, and grass. And that's probably what enables them to be such a successful species. And uh, even though almost everything eats them, and their numbers seem to increase year after year. And uh, they are uh, an unbelievable animal and actually very, very beautiful. And I'm very much looking forward to the lambing season. There's those baby impala and their little grunts are very cute. Okay, so if that male, ah, oh, there we go, I think I see Shanae. That looking for the male leopard tracks around here. We can wave at each other across the boundary. Now, fingers crossed that that male leopard is here somewhere. Now, this could be Shivambalan, uh, who is one of Karula's offspring. Uh, or it could be an unknown male from the Kruger. Or it could, of course, be Mr. Q. Okay, so let's have a quick look here. Michael says, well, I hope it's Mr. Q. That would be a nice surprise. So let's just have a quick look towards the Kruger boundary. Maybe he saw all those in parlor and thought, yum, yum, yum. Ah, there's a bird of prey, and it's going to be quite difficult because of the backlight. But before we go closer, I just want to have a, a, a quick look. Aha, general size, shape, and impression. Gives away the species. Oh, it falls in there, Dave. Oh, yeah. Let's get a bit closer. But uh, it is, um, I'm 98% certain it is an African hawk eagle. And I, looking through my binoculars, I just saw the shape of the head, the shape of the bill, and that's what led me to believe an African hawk eagle. Also, the size and uh, they are definitely one of my favorite eagle species we see regularly. And that pair on Juma gives us such wonderful, wonderful viewing. And uh, once between drives, I was actually on my way home and uh, I saw one take out a guinea fowl on quarantine. Now they do hunt lots of other birds. And there have been records of them. Oh, he's gonna fly, yeah. This is definitely a African hawk eagle. Now, I heard that go-away bird alarming, and I was really hoping it was to do with the male leopard, but I'm now 100% certain it was about that. Oh, well done, Dave. Oh, he's, a, he's, no, he's a Kruger hawk eagle. Okay, I just want to have a quick look. We're going to idle up to the boundary, see if I can see any tracks.
Okay. Uh, negative. No tracks here. So let's head towards Buff Pan. Uh, maybe we'll get some luck there. Now, hi, Sandy. Uh, Sandy is wondering if I've heard any news on Shadow's Cub. Uh, I haven't, Sandy. Um, I know Shadow was seen not so long ago, but no sign of her cub. Now, it doesn't mean it is expired. And uh, oh, I think I see Sinead driving opposite me there. I'm, I'm just going to call her on the radio. Sinead, any luck? Copy, thanks. Oh, I'm going to check towards Buff Pan and towards Kalkal. Okay, so no tracks going into the Kruger. Good news. Now, we just want him to come a little bit further south. And hopefully, we're going to go find a leopard in my favorite spot on Cheetah Plains on the red soils around Buff Pan. Now, while we do that, it seems like Adam has made his way into one of my fav other favorite spots in the Sabi Sands, the Mawati River. Hello, welcome back. Yeah, we're missioning down a dry riverbed, seeing what we can spot here. What if there are any interesting birds or... There's a crown chugger in front of... Okay, don't worry. He's just flown off, ducked off in the back there. Grey lurie flying off, but he's moving off there. Hoping, ho hoping something is having a relaxing morning light lying on the beach. <laughs> Hi there, Raya. Asking what is the rarest animal I've seen in the African bush? That would be an art wolf. I was lucky enough to see it quite a few years ago, doing a knife drive in one area. I've never seen one since. Very, very rare. I'm not too sure if they even occur here. I don't know about that. But yeah, if you look it up, Art Wolf. Got the grey, grey lurie above us. This is a very nice area. This. What would finish it off is definitely something relaxing on a bank here somewhere. Uh, then Lena asking, what is my advice on uh, training to be a guard? I've done a, personally, I've done a one-year course with uh, the Bush Academy. Uh, you, there are many different courses. You just have to you just have to check up on the, of the reliable course. Some courses can be flybys, so you just have to check if it's a good course. Go join it and then try getting somewhere to get experience and just take it from there. Experience experience is the main thing. So if you just got to try do a course, get into somewhere, and then take experience from there. Because once I did my one year course, I got a chance in, down in the Natal area in Zululand. And I've just been going on from there, just going on and on, and then, yeah, moving up to this opportunity, see where it takes me from there. Just go for old Buffalo sky, yeah, very, very old. Uh. See the elephants love this area. Lots of elephant dung everywhere. Yeah. Oh. Dark running there. Oh, 
be right there. There's the, the Daka is gone. Hi there, Justin, asking what my most scariest moments in the bush would be. Uh, that would be, one day I went to, I was doing a morning drive, we came across a group of elephants and they had just had a newborn baby. It was all white from the, the fluids after the, the, after the birth. The, elef the family were a couple meters away, they were very relaxed. Did my morning drive and then I, afternoon, I had another afternoon drive, so I came in there in the afternoon with my guests and I went that direction and told the guests, hopefully we get this baby little elephant we saw this morning, arrived there. The family were on the road, but uh, I said to them, oh, I can't see the female with the baby. And the one female, which I'm assuming was a matriarch, was just going from side to side of the road and she was just smashing trees. And then she, some cars were at the bottom and then she, she ran off to those cars. And then she turned around and she came up after me. They don't normally like to run uphill because that's just a mission for an elephant that, to, to come up the hill. So she took off up the hill after me. Luckily I had a bit of a gap and I would just hit the reverse foot flat, motored backwards. And then she stopped and then she moved down slowly. And then when I looked to my side mirror, I had the female and the baby behind me. So I was in between the family, so she was obviously, she wanted to protect her family. So I just drove into the bush and around the female, the, the baby, and moved off. And they joined up and they ducked off into the bush. So I knew if I'd got caught by that female, I would have been in some serious trouble because I was separating that family, especially the family from the female, the newborn baby. So it was quite a nerve-wracking time, got the blood pumping, made you feel alive. <laughs> An old hole from elephants digging. Sometimes in the riverbeds they they'll dig for the water, but I don't know if the water's really low here. In areas I know by us where we've got riverbeds like this, they dig for the water, and then other animals can come drink there. It gives house animals that can't normally dig for that water. The elephants will dig a hole, a little well. They drink. They leave. The other animals get a chance to come get some water. So the elephants are very helpful to other animals like that. Okay, we carry on searching back to Brent's and see what's happening there. I'm on these wonderful red soils, and it's the only really red soils we get uh, around our traverse area. Oh, there we go. Oops, sorry about that. I was losing, losing air. What's going on here? So we're still looking for these male leopard tracks. We're just going very slowly. The ground's quite hard here. And I'm just making sure that we don't miss them. Shanae is checking inside in Koro, but it doesn't look like this leopard is coming this far to the south yet. But who knows on the next bend. Just want to see that lovely fresh pug mark. Or I can see a tree climbing in parlor somewhere. Now it's probably nothing, but I have to double check. Nothing, just a shadow in the tree. Well, uh, another question from our new viewer, Dizzy Leo. 
great to have you on board. Uh, Dizzy Leo would like to know, <coughs> are some of the animals given names, or all of them, and how does it work? Uh, generally, it's really only the leopards that are named, and, uh, and that's just because to figure out the different territories, uh, etc. Uh, the lion prides are given names. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> It's unusual to name an individual lion, but in certain circumstances, like the amber-eyed lioness, she just got became amber eyes. I hear a branch breaking. Are there elephants? Yes, I did. <laughs> Hello, Ellie. Oh, nice young bull. Hello, mister. Nice bull, probably around 30. Not too relaxed, so I'm just going to keep a little bit of distance. He should relax um, in a few seconds. Here we go. That's a good boy. And uh, sometimes elephants are given names if there's a very distinguishing uh, mark. Or we've got a half trunk Ellie, we've got a half eared Ellie. Uh, generally, only really big tuskers are given names. Okay, let's see if we can get a slightly better view of him. So now he was a little bit. Unrelaxed, so I switched off my vehicle. Now I've started it. And just let him get used to the sound. Oh, he's going to come to us. That's better. Hello, mister. So, nice big Ellie ball. Now, the reason we've got to be a little bit more careful with some of the elephants and cheetah plants is that they do come in from the Kruger and they might not be as used to um, cars and game drives as the ones around Juma. There we go. So he's moving off towards. Oh, there we go. I can hear some more elephants in the distance. There might be a breeding herd. Oh my goodness, look what just fell onto us. It's a bagworm. Oh no, let me just... Oh, his silk has caught onto me. Can you see him there? Yeah. So you can see that little bagworm. You can see how he moves. And he's built himself a little bag, a protective bag that'll look like a thorn or a piece of bark. And he moves also by spinning silk. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Now, bagworm infestations can actually completely disappear the leaves on trees. Hey little, oh sorry my hat, in my shadow. Hey little guy. Um, I'm going to try and get him a bit closer to you. Um, where Dave is going to be the best. Yeah, no. So I don't know. I think that might be just slightly further away. A bit too close. That's good. Here we go. You can actually see him moving. And you can see he's built this little bag out of uh, little bits of wood and he shaped it in the shape of a thorn. Isn't that cool? Not something you see every day. So what happens, I think he was hanging from a silk thread as we drove under a tree and he just dropped onto me. Now, I'm, I'm going to put him back out in the bush um, it's just, there we go, there's a bush next to us there, with an the Ellie close by. So this is a small bagworm species, you can get ones that are massive and they build stick houses. This is just incredible, actually, you know what, um, I'm going to, I'll put him 
down a little bit later. I want to get my macro lens out just now and take some photos of him. Okay, well, there's that Ellie bull. I'm going to see if we can get a little bit closer to him. Uh, but if he shows like he's not feeling too relaxed, then we will leave him be. But I've had the car running and uh, been talking constantly, so a lot of those generally help to reassure uh, that we're not a threat. And his body language is looking good so far. Here we go. Hello, mister. Sorry, I just had to be on the radio quickly. Standing by, Herbie. Cheetah plans. Copy, thanks. I'll pass the message on. So that ostrich, that random single ostrich we saw on yesterday's sunset safari, Herbie is found again. So if Final Control would like to tell Adam that it's on Zoe's uh, heading west towards the Gauri Gate. Okay, so we're coming up to our northern boundary here on Cheetah Plains and uh, I think he's going to disappear into the thickets and um, we're going to leave him be. We're going to carry on. Yes, this is a zebra. Oh, is he going to chase the zebra for fun? Yes, he is. <laughs> I like elephant bulls. Let's just see if we can get one more view. So a very, a very interesting, oh, good question from John is that if Kruger is open, oh, is he chasing Impala now? Let's see if he chases the zebra again for fun. But this is as far as we can traverse, I'm afraid. Now, John would like to know, if Kruger is open, why can't anyone drive there? Oh, sorry, Herbie's calling me again. Standing by. Copy, I'm coming. Okay, so Herbie's just given me some good news, so I'm going to shoot back up to the north, to Juma, as that elephant crosses into Inkoro. Bye-bye, big boy. <coughs> Okay, so while we shoot back towards uh, Juma, let's go see how Adam is doing. Hello, look what we have found. My, one of my, well, me, my favorite, the, the Eli, the Afri Savannah African elephant. Nice little family are having their morning breakfast. Shame, they better really dig around for food. But they eat all types of vegetation. You watch this one when they grab with their trunk and she's kicking it to break, break the branches. At the end of the elephant's trunk, they've got like two little fingers where they can grip, grip the thing like uh, the, the, the food or the branch or anything like a, like a hair. We're just gonna link quickly to Brent. He's got something. We will stay out the elephants for you guys and we'll see you just now. There is an animal we do not see. There is an animal we do not see every day. A reed buck. Now I think this is the second one ever seen uh, since I've been here at least. I think Sam saw one down on Cheetah Plains. There you go, female reed buck. Watch out for the cheetahs. They like reed buck. So one of the, the more rare antelope species in uh, <coughs> the Sabi Sands, and particularly in this area, well, off it goes. 
Wow. That was amazing. Very cool. Okay, we're going to get back on the long road to the north. There we go. Cheetah plants produced a species we don't often see. That could be a new mammal for a lot of you guys if on your mammal lists. Uh, so while we rush back to the north, let's uh, go and see how Adam is faring with the Ellie's. <coughs> Watching a little female elephant here eating the branch. You see the fingers there I was telling you about, where she can hold the branch and move it around like a hand. Sometimes with some Ellie's where they, they, the end of their fingers, they touch and smell everything, very good sense of smell. And they sometimes get caught in snares, which is not a, not a good thing, but there are a lot that happens. There's lots of snares around. You get poachers coming into the reserves. And they lose the end of their fingers, well the, the finger parts of their trunk and I've watched where it was a couple of males that had lost the end of their trunk and when they're eating on the grass they, they, they use it like spaghetti, they just twirl it around, twirl it around, put it up against their foot, pull it out like that and then grab it. And I've also read a story of a female that had lost her trunk right up to, right up to her mouth so she had nothing. And the, the, the herd actually adjusted their eating habits and where they go so they could go to an easier place for this female to eat. And she was surviving and growing. That was a few years ago. Obviously, I don't know what the outcome was, but she was doing well. Gently flapping the ears, cooling down. Skin is a lot thinner on the other side of the ears. And you'll see a big network of veins. So obviously, when they're very hot, they pump their blood around their ears. They're not too hot at the moment. They're just giving slight slight waves around. There's quite a few Ellie's spread around, all trying to find something to eat. It's a nice, a nice little baby going on the other side there. Female's pregnant for about 22 months. Has generally one baby, but she can have twins. And she will successfully rear both of them because a the female has two mammary glands between her front legs, not at the back legs, between the front legs. I'm trying to move the, the old tree so you can get underneath, get, maybe getting the roots. There you go, kick it out the way and push the sand out the way, get some roots. Obviously roots have a lot of nutrition inside them. And the ears are very important to them. They make up about, up about 40% of the body surface of an elephant. So as she holds it open, if an elephant's giving you a warning charge, they lift the head up and hold the ears open like that. Obviously, make their posture bigger, try and intimidate you. Maybe she's trying to intimidate the roots there. Another dark tranquility asking about an elephant losing its trunk. It's, it, the main thing I'll say is snares. Because obviously the, the, the way the poachers set them up and the elephant gets there, they're touching and smelling and they get it through and then they panic and pull it and it tightens up and then they lose their trunk. Another way, not so common, but I have seen photos of it, is crocodiles. You know, when they, um, elephants put their trunk in the water, suck the water up, crocodile comes, grabs the end. And I've seen photos where the elephant pulls his trunk out, there's actually a crocodile hanging at the end of it. Sometimes they manage to get the trunk off, or sometimes the air crocodile is let go. But the most common would be a snare out in the bush from a poacher. That's what I'd say is the most common. And yeah, she's succeeding in getting the roots. Question from Patricia, have I ever seen elephant twins? I think I have because I'm not 100% sure because I didn't see them get born, but I did witness a female with two little ones with exactly the same size and hanging around her. So 
I'm assuming they were twins yeah. uh, down there in the three game reserve. So I have, I have what I think witnessed it. Oh, get down in there. Oh, poor tree. <laughs> Life's hard in the. Hi there, Virginia and Kentucky. Uh, asking about if I've seen an elephant give birth. I've just missed it. I've arrived there just after where well, I must have been an hour or so later than the elephant because it was still white from the, the, the fluids after the birth. And it was, the baby was still dotting around. The other, the other females were kind of holding it up. So it was, I just missed it. Would have been awesome to see. A little female blank dust on her. Oh, it's definitely warming up a bit in the sun. Should have brought my hair. Oh, there's a, there's a young male kind of. Yeah, it's a young male. If you look at the female, you'll see she has a flat front of the head, flat top of the head, so it makes a sharp angle, and the males get a round head. The reason why. <laughs> joke while the, f the females have a flat front of the head like I said they're pregnant for 22 months when a female gets pregnant she goes to the tree and she bashes her head up against the tree because I'm pregnant for 22 months so she's like why did I do it and bashes on the tree the little boy young little guy checking what's going on obviously once they come oh no he's and the steeler spoils. The forktail drongo, he's coming up on top of the branch here. Often you'll find the forktail drongo, as you see, he's landed in the grass there. And he's flying back up to the branch. You'll find them following animals around because as the animal's going through the grass, he's going to be disturbing the insects. Easy way of finding your food. So you just fly down and pick it up. So you hang around the, the big animals like that. That young male is very rude. Yeah. Oh, I just heard a, another tree. Yeah. Another angry. Ah, that's right. Asking if there are natural diseases that can shorten elephant life. Uh, I've heard of. I'm not 100% sure, but I've heard of anthrax can do it, but I'm not 100% sure with, with that question. This young male wasn't very nice. He came in, this young female had the spots and she was having nice roots there, and this young male just came and took over. If you go behind the, the female now, she's facing away. If she brings her ears forward, you'll see the big network of veins behind her ears where the skin is a lot thinner. Oh, no, no, she's turning away. Also, if you look at an elephant's feet, they are very soft. On a tar, like a tar road or a much harder road, and if you face in the opposite direction, an elephant can actually sneak up on you. They basically walk on their tippy toes and a very soft, spongy foot. Helps as a shock absorber. Can also help for feeling vibrations in the ground. A little fork-tailed drongo, he's not going anywhere. Uh, Michael asking about my most, me another most memorable elephant sighting. That would be, I was, I've, I've experienced it twice. I don't know why, but there was a lot of families coming together. They, they all just started trumpeting and screaming and running out the bushes. And it was, we estimate close to 300 elephants together. They all just ran out, joined each other, males just pouring out the bush, trumpeting, and they just went crashing through the bush and then just di disappeared. I have no idea why they did it, but I have like, seen that twice of about 300 plus elephants. So that was quite something to see, such huge numbers together. Oh, so I just got to take his jacket off. I'm, I'm warming up here a bit. Warm out here. Yeah. 
Oh, the female's taking down another tree. Should I try to get around here so we can see the little baby? He's trying to eat here. This little baby's trying to dig up roots here. There we go. You champ, you. Hello, Justin, asking how heavy a newborn calf is. It's about 120 kilograms, newborn calf. So imagine with a female having twins, it's 240 kilograms, but females are big, they can handle that. The vehicle. Female having dust bath the other, on the other side of this baby. All helps with parasites. Uh, the red billed oxpecker, I'm sure you guys, some of you guys will know, you know, they go on the animals to eat the parasites and help clean the animals. Elephants do not allow them on. And I did witness once where it must have been a new, new oxpecker came to an elephant, landed on the elephant behind her ears, obviously wanted to come eat some par parasites, and sh the elephant just f banged his ear up against the oxpecker. Oxpecker hit the deck and it flew away. So I reckon he's never going back to elephants ever again. So they use dust and mud to help get rid of the parasites. Oh, the little one didn't suddenly didn't like us. You don't see much big big tuskers anymore. It's a genetic thing to either have big ones or small ones. So you can't look at this young male and think, well, he's got small tusks, he's young. I've seen some very big male elephants with tiny little tusks. I also haven't yet, but I'm still waiting to see a very big tusked elephant. That's one another thing I would love to see. Running a bit forward for you. Right, there we go. With the most amazing brown eyes. I'm always trying to take, get a nice photo of it, but if you look close, they've got very long eyelashes, obviously, to shield the eye from sun or mud or so. But the eyelashes get very long, so trying to get a good eye shot is always very hard. When an elephant's upset, his eyes are very open, but I'm more worried about driving than taking a photo then. They so spend most of the day eating. Relax during the middle of the day in the shady spots if it's a hot day. Then go into the afternoon eating. Uh, sleep during the middle of the night. So the rest of the time eating. Oh, their system is, isn't the greatest. It's very quick. I was saying about earlier with the marulas, how they pass through so quickly. The elephant on average can go to the toilet about 20 times a day. That's why you see so much dung. You can always see when ele elephants been. There's dung everywhere. Uh, other animals might eat elephants' dung, but the little baby elephants, they will eat their mother's dung. And normally you see the elephant's dung is like a hard ball and it hits the ground. Uh, I've, something I've also witnessed three times. There's a female walking into the road in front of me having a real sloppy, runny dung all over the road stand still and then all the babies come and then eat it all of it and then, then they move off i've experienced that three times so i mean rare i don't know if she does it like on purpose does it on purpose to make a sloppy dung or what i'm not sure but okay we're going to cut back to brent Brian and I will stay with the Ellie's for a bit, see how things go, and we'll maybe move on. Back to Brent. Okay, so we are doing, oh, Davi, we're doing a bit of a safari safari. Uh, there's a very important reason for that, and I am, of course, 
being me, not going to tell you what. So I do need to move quite quickly, but I love having you on the back with me. So, uh, John, I know I got very sidetracked, like I just did right now, but those are just hyena tracks. Um, I got very sidetracked when I got that wonderful update in my ear. So I'm racing towards that area. But John was asking, if the Kruger Park is open, why can't everyone drive there? So, okay, John, the way it works, is the Kruger Park is a national park. It is uh, owned by the South African government or South African people, if you could say that. And uh, uh, if you drive into Kruger, you can self-drive yourself around. You're not allowed to off-road and you're not allowed to um, sort of follow animals at night. You've got to be back in during daytime. Uh, a lot of rules like that. And that's, of course, because a lot of people driving around there aren't professional safari guides. Now, inside the Kruger, there are private concessions, so where companies will pay uh, a fixed amount per year to have a private concession off the main tourist roads in the Kruger, where you are able to off-road, drive at night, etc., like we do here. I have worked in one of those concessions. So, uh, but because the Kruger's mandate is to maintain the government mandate from from Kong, uh, not, from uh, the Constitution. Kruger's mandate is to maintain the highest possible biodiversity in that reserve. So areas like this western area of Kruger, near where we are, is deemed a wilderness area. There are a few little management tracks uh, for the crop park officials to do what they need to do in those areas. But other than that, apart from anti-poaching patrols, those areas are left as wilderness areas. Uh, so there's no tourists, there's no cars, there's no tourism in that area. And they've got a few of these massive areas in Kruger where the animals can just be the animals uh, without people. And, and it, it is a needed thing. And also it's areas where different scientists will study different things, uh, elephant uh, populations, uh, how they affect the bush, uh, all these different things. So that's why you can't just drive uh, anywhere in Kruger. Now, can you imagine Kruger gets millions of visitors a year. If you let millions of people in their own cars drive around the bush like we do, it would probably be quite detrimental to the bush. Uh, we know which trees to drive over, which grow slowly, uh, which pop back up, which don't. So there's a lot of other things that we look at, John, and, uh, and that's why you can't just drive anywhere in Kruger. Okay, we're on the move now. We are on our eastern boundary, but we're heading to the northern boundary. We're going to hit that northern boundary and we're going to go straight west. And uh, I, think, I think many people are going to be ecstatic at what we're going to see. So if we do fly past a hornbill like that, or past an impala which is coming up, You've just got to trust me. Where I'm going is worth it. And remember, if you'd like to have a gander, have a guess at where we're off to, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email questions at wildearth.tv. Hi, Joey. Uh, Joey, another question from Joey in Oz. Uh, Joey would like to know, of everywhere in Africa that I've been, what area has had the biggest variation of species? Now, Joey, that's uh, actually quite a difficult question because uh, it depends on what your definition of species is. Um, if it's all species, the probably the place with the, the greatest diversity of species, but remember, most of those species are, are small and a very minimal, low, uh, mammal di di uh, diversity would be the Congo Basin rainforest. Let me just turn this down. Um, so the and that's insects, butterflies, birds, um, leeches, uh, fish, reptiles, snakes, all that. But in terms of large mammals, which is I think you're probably thinking, let me think. This is actually quite a difficult one. Um, hmm. Uh, probably, oh, I'm going to have to think about this, Jay. So while I think about it, 
uh, let's uh, pop back across to Adam and a gorgeous baby Ellie. Welcome back. As you can see, the baby Ellie has now run away. It did get very brave to us, gave a little, a little warning, ran towards mommy there, and there was a bit of a thorn bush it couldn't cross, so it's got upset and now it's run off that way. It's running off. Oh, it's gone. No, it was not happy with us. There he runs down there. Where are you going to all the other Ellie's down there? We still have another baby on the right of us, so he's not even worried. He's just been munching around the tree there. Here, the little baby. There. I was. Uh, how they? Um, well, I'm not too sure about up in this area, but I know elephants' numbers increase quite a lot because the, there's very few deaths amongst the babies. And down by me, how they actually sorted, started sourcing that out is they darted some of the females with contraceptive, so it, it puts them out of action for like five years to try to slow the breeding rate, and because. As you see around here, especially lots of pushed over trees and pushing over and eating the roots or, or ring barking the trees and eating all the bark around it and then ends up damaging everything. And because we've put fences around them, you force an elephant to stay in the area, so it becomes a problem when the, the numbers get quite great. I'm not too sure on numbers here or what the situation is, but I'm just talking from experience by my side. They do the contraceptive to slow it down. Come on, you can grab that branch. It's a young little male. Yeah, that's a young male. That was a young female that ran across the road in front of him. She had, she was a lot more cheekier than this guy. Oh, you a rough water bit here for you. Got, got a female taking out a bush here to get roots. And her youngsters joining her to come See if we can score a meal. So you're using your feet to dig up the roots. And it wants to see what mommy's found. You know, the, the leader of a family is a female, not a male. It's a matriarchal system, which I'm sure the ladies like to hear. <laughs> Looks like most of the herd are moving off to the left. So come here. There's a big female there. Funny, I was, well, something I was just talking to Brian about was with, with, with El, sorry, Sandy, hello Sandy. Something funny things I've seen in the park. I was just talking to Brian about we were uh, marulas and elephants. Elephants pass a lot of gas, so sometimes when you them you hear them farting a lot. And it was actually an elephant farting and marulas coming, <laughs> shooting out behind him while he was farting. It's just something I was talking about shortly. That was quite a laugh to see. Yeah, they make a lot of gas being hind gut fermenters, so they produce a lot of gas. The female's got a nice fat branch. I can see if, looks like she's eating all just the bark off of it. I think she's just eating the bark off the branch. I, don't know, I can't see if she's Oh, the little baby's on the road in front of us. Oh, oh, sorry, it's another baby. This one's still here. Quite a few babies amongst this, this family. 
They do have their babies any time of year. I'm just gonna go around to these guys, bro. See what's happening here. Sorry, little Ellie, don't mean to make you nervous. Uh, question from Susan, can we tell who the matriarch is? I think, I can't see all the, the elephants are spread through all, all, all over here. I think it's this big female at the back here, but I'm not 100% sure, because you normally, I'm, I'm going by just the, she looks the biggest and the oldest at the back here. Oh, look, little babies suckling milk. See, remember I said the mammary glands are between the front legs? You know, there's one eating all the bark. Oh, no, suckle milk again. There we go. Where? There. That was that little female that came running across the road at us and then ran off into the bush having a tantrum. See, obviously wanted some milk. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, they, they don't use their trunk. You see the trunk flopped against the head. She is using her mouth. She's putting the nipple straight into her mouth. And the mother puts a leg forward, puts a nipple in her mouth and suck. Oh, that female's got no tusks, though. It does happen that you see some elephants with, with no tusks. Well, that one, the big female at the back is having a lovely time with that branch. Oh, it looks like she's peeling all the bark off it at the back. Yeah, how they cross it. I love it when they do that. Look at this one close to her. has got his legs crossed. It's relaxing, having something to eat, cross the legs and chill. You see it's getting a little warm. Ears are flapping a little bit more. They'd also like to go to water. Then dependent a lot on water drinking, also putting the mud and water on them to cool down and help with the parasites. So I don't know, I'm not sure which direction they would go for the water here because I'm still not sure on that my bearings with the water directions there. The intervals between having babies can be three to four years between each baby. I'm just going to go forward a bit so you can see this big female suck. She's eating all the bark off, off the yellow. She's not eating the branch, she's like grinding, putting it in molars and she's breaking all the bark off of it. Nice big female then. I've seen different shape of tusks. Like her ones are a little skew. Generally they can be alright. Like evenly shaped, like the little one to the left here. I have seen where a female's tusks actually all turned inwards. They were crossing over underneath her trunk. Waves a branch around like it's nothing. Um, the, and this uh, African elephant, like I was talking about, with the two fingers at the end. Indian elephant has one finger at the end of the trunk. And obviously, Indian elephant has smaller ears. Yeah. But elephants need to have big ears. If you ever ask anyone, what's an, 
What does an elephant look like? They'll say an elephant has big ears and a trunk. Our elephants are much better than the, the, the Indian elephant. Okay, well, Brian and I will stay here and we'll link across to Brent and see what's happening that side. We're getting close. Oh, Dave. Sorry, that's my... So, we are getting very close and I'm sure there's lots of speculation. Have I been racing for my favorite animal, the African wild dog? Now, there were wild dog tracks in this area, but it's not a wild dog. How was I racing for, uh, to see if my dreams were fulfilled? Were my dreams fulfilled? I don't know. I can't tell you just yet. What do you think, Dave? Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, exactly. So, we are getting quite close now. Uh, you're going to be able to enjoy the moment of discovery with us as we go into the sighting and see what creature it could be. And I see the cars, so I now know we are very close, it's very exciting. Should we just wait here for a while? Oh, no, 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 let's go. Oops, and now, oh, no, we're going to wait. The car's broken. Okay. We almost need, like, a slow drum roll here. I haven't spotted it yet, but I do know what it is, so I have an unfair advantage. And we are going over, over, over. Just trying to have a look. Let's maybe go through this little gap. Can you see it yet, Dave? There's everyone looking. So we've got lion cubs, cheetah, ostrich. Oh, whoopsie. Attack. Okay. I think we're going to get a visual in the next few seconds. Have you spotted it? I um, know what it is. It is a leopard, but which leopard is it? Ah, oh, it's a leopard. But who could it be? Oh, don't go disappear around the termite mount. There we go. There it is, disappearing from us. Ah, look there, it's Cindyla. You can see his collar. Now he's been popping up and around and all over the place recently. He was all the way about 30, 40 kilometers away from us in the Kruger, but he's back. But let's stick with him. Now, if we do have any new viewers uh, who are a little bit confused by why this leopard is wearing a collar, it's a really long story. And uh, I, I was there the day that this story began, so, sort of. So what happened is that he was about a year old and he caught a, a rabid dog that came in to the area and uh, unfortunately um, he had to go into quarantine so he left the bush and he had to go get rabies injections and uh, and all sorts of things and after about eight months out of the bush 
he was released back into his the area where he was darted and removed and he is now back he's now a nomadic male he's too young to hold territory so he is nicknamed the wanderer or Cindile the survivor now he is the only cub of the female leopard shadow who's made it to adulthood And he's doing a good job of wandering around these thickets at the moment. I wonder why. Maybe he's on the prowl for something. Oh, quickly, before we go past beautiful little Koki Franklins. Look at that. Hiding from us. But, well, let's get back to young Sindile. But always nice to notice the small things that are around us as well. Where did he disappear to? I just lost visual of him. Dave, do you see him? Oh, that was close. There he is. Look at that. Oh, he's looking like he's not too hungry but he could definitely eat and I just noticed he's got a kill in a tree isn't that awesome let's just go a bit closer maybe he's going to be going up that kill the last time I was tracking Sindile was actually very close to here and I found where he had lost his kill to hyenas so it looks like he's learned his lesson and he's uh, popped it up in a tree So it looks like he's lying down now. It looks like a little stenbok that he's caught. Okay, we're just gonna watch out there, Dave. Get ourselves into a good spot. Oh, there still looks like there's quite a lot of meat on there. Maybe it's a bit bigger than a stenbok. Maybe it's a, a young impala. And we'll have a closer look now. Hello, big boy. You've grown so much. There he is. Oh, so great to catch up with him again. He is looking magnificent. He had a lovely golden hue on his coat. Now, I know a lot of you might be a bit worried about that collar, but it's one of these fancy new ones uh, that after when the battery starts getting very low, it pops off all by itself. And then it sends a GPS signal so the scientists who put that collar on can come collect it and get all that data. And he keeps looking up in the tree and that's, it looks like an impala to me. Here we go. Looks like a, an impala, maybe one of last year's babies, or even an adult female, now that I'm a bit closer. And as James Richard says, all that suspense was totally worth it to see young Sindile, aka the survivor, aka the wanderer. And he is looking in a very good condition. He's just got to watch out in this area for Mr. Tingana. And of course, wouldn't it be funny if Mvula came again and happened to steal his kill again? No, just hang on a second. Has he got two kills in that tree? Just give me a second. I've just only noticed, or is it just. Another piece of the kill.
That's very strange. I'm going to have a closer look a little bit later. But it looks like there might be... No, it's just the leg. If we come down, it's one of the legs got caught, obviously, while he was coming up. So there is a, another leg there. I thought there might be a dike as well as an impala. Now, the only reason I thought that is because a uh, young quarantine was seen on Torchwood with an impala and a diker in a tree. So what happens, he caught the impala first and then a diker happened to wander close to him. So he pounced. There we go. He's resting now. His meat is safe from hyenas. Tiggy, yes, Sindila seems to have learned the hard lesson about treeing your kills, uh, even though his mother is probably one of the worst leopards at hoisting her kills uh, in our area. But so wonderful to catch up with him and to see him in such good condition. I know he's a favorite of a lot of our viewers out there and such a wonderful story. I mean, a lot of us didn't think he'd ever come back to the wild, but here he is, wild and free in the African bush again. Absolutely magnificent. Anna Marie says his face looks a lot like Anderson's. Oh, Anna Marie, it's very, very difficult to say whether his dad is Anderson based on physical uh, physical identifiers, and uh, the only way to tell will be from genetics. Hello, Mister. Now, we spent many, many joyful hours with this young male when he was younger, before he went into quarantine. One of his favorite tricks is when you tracked him on foot, he used to follow you back to the car. Yes, you did. And he's looking quite content, impala in the tree, a bit of shade. Now, the one thing that might be a little problem for him is the particular tree he's chosen to put that impala in. We don't know whether he had to do it under pressure, uh, if there were hyenas around when he did it, but it is very open and it's, uh, there's a very strong possibility that a vulture might be able to spot that. So he might have a hard time keeping the vultures at bay. And with all the lion kills that are happening at the moment, we do have a lot of vultures in this area. Hi, Jennifer, in San Francisco. Now, Jennifer said, that they were told that the collar would fall off when there was a certain amount of pressure. Um, yes, so it's either pressure or battery. Uh, so if the battery gets too low, and that release mechanism might not work, so if the battery gets to a certain point, it will more automatically trigger the release mechanism, or when the collar gets too tight. <coughs> Now, we're going to sit here. Hopefully he goes up the tree and has a feed just now. But while we do that, let's go back to Adam and the eddies. Welcome back to the eddies who are still doing what they're doing best, eating. There's still some, there's some behind us that have kind of gone 
that direction, but these ones are moving up the road slowly foraging for food. We were just talking about all the destruction around here, as you can just see everything broken. Oh. Interaction there. Oh, there goes another tree. In moderation, the elephants are good with the pushing over. They stop bush encroachment, they open up the bush. And other little animals that can't eat up on the trees or eat the roots, they get a chance to eat. So, and then normally the elephants would just move off and go to other areas. But because of us putting fences around them, we are forcing them to stay in the area. And this is where the problem comes in. And as you can see, the, the amount of destruction and, and with the drought, that's not helping much either. Compared to here and where, where I come from down in Zululand, there there's still plenty of food of everything. So the animals are eating all sorts. Where I know that a lot of here is going on to eating on the trees, the bark and the roots. And that's where a lot of destruction, there's more destruction here than compared to down by where I come from, that side, where there's still, there's green grass, there's a lot of green shrubbery. So they, they still got a big variety of food they can eat on catching a bit of a speed while we're walking down the hill. Try to roll forward a bit. Hmm. Another one meter. African roadblock. Tiger asking how old these elephants are. There's a whole variety. I think there's one female at the back there that must be around towards 50, 60 years, somewhere around there. And then you've got some little juniors, I'd say, a couple of years running while they were here. They've gone around. This one in front of us is female, maybe up to around in the 20s, early 30s, somewhere around there. So there's a whole variety of, of ages. I just heard something rumbling, rumbling on the side on the right. Okay, we're going to link back to Brett to go look at the leopard that I would have loved to have seen. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Hopefully Adam can come have a look after the safari. Um, but there we go. Young Sindile. I'm really hoping he does go up the tree. Just look how those colours merge with the dry winter bush felt around. Keeps looking up at the kill, and as I said, doesn't look too fat just yet. So maybe he will climb the tree before the end of the safari. Now, it's difficult to judge when that collar might pop off, um, but looking, I'd say, purely on a size basis, probably in the next three months. But I've got a feeling the battery will probably run out before then. 
So it's one of those strange ones, and I've had quite a lot of dealings with collars and, and, and things like that, and are doing predator research in other parts of Africa, and it is a very funny one. You never quite know. Sometimes the batteries last three years. Normally, they're supposed to last about 18 months, but they normally don't last nearly as long as that. And it also depends on the type of collar. So you've got different types of collars. You've got radio collars that work off telemetry, that ping. And then this is now, uh, this has both. So this has got radio te telemetry uh, as well as satellite GPS. So that top one will ping a satellite. And that'll not let the Kheri, who's the, the scientist who's doing the research on male dispersal patterns, uh, will let him know exactly where he is. And judging from those pings, you can actually work out when he's on a kill, because he'll be in one area for a couple of days. Um, and it's quite difficult to see a direct movement, because obviously it doesn't ping all the time. Uh, normally they ping, I think, twice a day. Uh, but as the battery gets a little bit older, they'll generally only ping once a day, sometimes even once a week. Uh, now, Anne in Durban. Hi, Anne. Always great to have you with us, Anne. Uh, Anne says, isn't it amazing that uh, his removal from the Sabi sands uh, could possibly have aided in his survival? That's a very interesting point to look at, Anne. It, it, is, it is possible. Uh, but, I mean, he was almost independent uh, by the time he grabbed that unfortunate canine. Uh, so I think he might have he might have been okay. He was already eating for himself quite frequently. And his shadow being shadow used to leave him for extended periods all on his own. So even though his eyes are closed and he's sneezing, watch his ears. They're still on the move. Hi, Birdie in Georgia. Birdie would like to know, will he climb a tree if a vulture attempts to feed on his kill? Most definitely, Birdie. Uh, he will protect that kill uh, very aggressively. Now, come on, boy. It's time to go have a snack. So it looks like an adult impala the longer I look at it. Uh, we'll try to have a closer look at it just now. Is this just special? Sitting quietly next to young Sindile. Now Tobias is wondering, when his collar does fall off, how do I think it'll affect him? I don't think it'll affect him at all. Um, he probably notice it for the first while, but then after a few days, he probably won't notice it at all. that head getting heavy. And see how those ears are always working. He's got a lovely dark coat, much darker than his mum. He is going to be a magnificent male uh, when he gets to his prime. Now, let's go from some spots to some stripes with Adam. And here we have some plain zebras. 
On to the right, some male. You can see from underneath his tail, between his back legs, thin black stripe. Where the females get a thick black stripe going on all the way underneath. These zebras have got very nice markings. I was just talking to Brian about the, the ones by us. Where I've heard a story that there's a bit of inbreeding, so they're, they're starting to lose their stripes towards the end. There's some zebras which almost look like quachas, where they don't have any stripes. It's two males that we are looking at here. Two males there. The um, plain zebra, how you tell them apart from other zebras, you'll see their black stripes go all the way underneath their stomach. With other zebras, the black stripes will stop along the side of the stomach. I'm just going to get closer. Oh, hold on, Brian. I think they were at, look, is there water at that dam? Uh, and I think they're obviously coming for some water. You know, every, every zebra has its own stripes. It's unique to each animal. It's a fingerprint. If you're your zebra is also, if your zebra is very unhealthy and sick, the mane will fall over like a horse, but your zebra is going to be very sick for that to happen. Normally you get eaten before then. Now it's being a two males, obviously if they don't have any females, they join up with, with another male, go around for safety. Uh, they don't want to be hanging around and have any photos. They're going on their own. There's a vulture very far away, circling the distance there. And even further back, there's more, but look, well, it's very, very far. Let's see. I think it's white back, but it is a bit far to tell exactly is. is. You can hear the Franklins chirping away behind us in the bushes at the back here. There's hippo tracks there, they're not very... You see the way hippos come along here, Brian. See one toe, two toe, and four, the other two toes there. One of your uh, hippo gone on this walkabout. I'm going to head on back this way, see where the zebras are going, which direction they're going. Okay, we're going back to Brent to see the leopard. Enjoy. So we've changed our position slightly, and of course now he turns his head the other way. What if he heard? He's looking back behind him. Here we go, back through the gap. That's where we want him to look, straight at us. Oh, pretty boy. Now he's eyeing his carcass. We are hoping that he will maybe take a leap up the tree. Now, James Richard wants to go into controversial territory, um, but you know, let's take a little a dabble at it. So, James says he heard that some of the other lodges are hesitant to go to a sighting of this leopard because of the collar. Uh, I can understand why. Now, for us, of course, it's an incredible story, and, and, and in his case, I think it's, a, it's an abnormal story and, and a real sort of success story. Uh, but I know a lot of lodges, especially in the Sabi Sands, uh, their main income is off tourism. 
and a lot of that is photographic tourism. So you get lots of people with lots of big cameras and uh, collars are not very pretty uh, on your photographs. So that's one of the reasons a lot of the lodges do not like collars. Now there are plenty of areas um, where animals are collared, sometimes for their protection. Uh, for example, Karoo National Park, there was that male lion who kept escaping and getting in, stuck into the cows and goats outside the reserve. So he was collared for his protection. So every time he got out, national parks could get him and bring him back, for an example. Now, other collars are used for scientific data. So Panthera does have collar on, collars on certain animals. Generally, in the Sabi sands, uh, collars are not really needed. Uh, our leopards are habituated enough We've got great trackers, so we can find them without a collar. But if you imagine, if you're doing research in one of those vast wilderness areas in Kruger, or in Botswana, or in Zambia, or in Zimbabwe, and uh, there are not many roads, and a collar is a very important tool to see how the dispersal of a leopard works, and uh, to see if it's different from an area where there's high, high ecotourism. So it, it, it all depends. So there is a place for collars and there's a place for not. They're not really needed in the Sabi Sands. Um, almost all the behavior that's recorded by the different safari companies is, is, is documented and fed through to a panthera, sightings, scat. So, but I do understand why Sandile was collared. <laughs> As I said, this is a very abnormal situation. And uh, the reason for that being is that as far as I know, he's one of the first leopards to go for rabies treatment and be successfully released back into the wild. So that, that for me is fascinating and I understand um, why he was collared because they wanted to see whether his dispersal pattern fitted in with uh, what normal ma young male leopards would do, whether being in, in captivity for a few months uh, would have changed his movements or what he was going to do. Uh, and we have uh, seen and documented some incredible interactions, especially with him and his mother, who has now got another cub, or we hope she's still got another cub. Um, so there's been lots and lots of uh, important stuff that could have been gleaned um, from this collar. So I would say in this situation, um, it's, a, it's an abnormal situation, so I don't personally see any problem with the collar. Uh, but I can understand from an aesthetic point of view why quite a few of the safari lodges um, wouldn't want to go to sightings of this leopard. Now, of course, as I said, for us, it's a fascinating story. We've been there through him grabbing the dog, him leaving the reserve, him coming back and being spotted for the first time. So, of course, we love seeing Sindile. And uh, uh, we must remember, we're a lot more invested. We've been following him his whole life. Uh, where there is a lot of guests only coming in for two or three days and, and then moving on to the next spot. Oh, tired kitty. Let me just try and move uh, forward, I think, slightly. How's that, Dave? Is that the spot? There we go. Now, Spike's wondering why not put a chip in the animal for tracking purposes. Um, the range on the chips is very, very low. Uh, you cannot feed it through to a satellite generally, uh, especially if he goes into a drainage line. The other thing is in some of the tests with chips, uh, it looks like that some of those chips can cause uh, cancerous growths on the animals. So the, the technology for chips probably hasn't quite evolved enough uh, for the use on tracking wildlife yet. But possibly in the, in the near future, maybe with uh, technological developments, uh, an underskin chip would be a better option. But for now, um, for the least effect on an animal, uh, and also you must remember a chip is an invasive procedure. You've got to cut open the animal, you've got to break the skin, you have to insert the chip, you have to uh, then stitch the animal back up, and then when that chip runs out, you've got to then re dart the animal, cut it open again, uh, take the chip out. Whereas with a collar like this, um, he only needs to be darted uh, when the collar is put on and the collar will get off by itself. So as I said, there's two, two ways that that collar will, will, will snap off. One, there's a pressure sensor. When his neck gets too big, uh, that collar will immediately pop off. Secondly, if the battery starts getting low, um, the collar will pop off to ensure that there's enough battery to uh, activate that mechanic, uh, that 
magnetic um, uh, mechanism that, that ensures that the collar uh, will not stay on him while he gets too big for it. Very contented, youth-looking leopard at the moment. Kill in the tree, big kill, nice big impala. Water hole not far away. So David's wondering what type of vehicles has Sindile been exposed to over the last few months. So David, um, he would have been exposed to mostly game vehicles like he's exposed to up here in the north. The majority of the time he has stayed within the Sabi sands or he has been into the wilderness areas in Kruger where there are no other vehicles. Now, the only time he might have been exposed to normal vehicles, but one must remember where he was left by shadow was often on Gauri Main, so he was often surrounded by commercial vehicles, transfer vehicles, so he has a particular uh, sort of nonchalance against all types of vehicles. And I have seen him stalk a VW Polo before when he was about seven months old on Gauri Main. So since he's come back, the only time he might have been exposed to those types of vehicles was in his short trip to Skukuza in the Kruger National Park. Is he seen? Are there some animals or impala or something behind there? He keeps looking into the distance. Okay, well, we're going to sit here, see what he gets up to. While we do that, and it is so exciting to catch up with him again, let's go see where Adam is exploring. Yeah, we've just been uh, missioning around here, seeing what we can find. A bit quieter. We did go past some impalas further back there. Some more. Oh, there's one, two, three, four, five vultures starting to take off and fly. Six vultures all coming out there, starting to ride the warm thermals, going higher. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven vultures now. They're all coming out, take, riding the warm, warm thermals, carry them higher. Let's see which, which we can make out which ones it is. Look like majority white back vultures. Um, hi there, Deja Vu, asking if I see the same animals in Natal to Sabi Sands. Generally, most of them are pretty much the same, all the big animals. Uh, maybe a few of the different smaller animals might be different in areas. I know further in, like towards the Kruger side, there are different antelopes that we do not get. We just got a few down that side of a few of the general antelopes, Impala, Niala, Kudus, and that's about it. Uh, Bushbuck and obviously dakers and small ones, sorry, but uh, there are different antelopes in here that we do not get. I'd say that's about the, the only major difference. They're nicely circling, coming towards us, riding a thermal now. Carry them higher to go look food. Obviously, vultures do not kill anything, they only eat dead stuff, so they will be watching each other while they're flying around and watching for a leopard sitting in a tree. <laughs> oh, oh. A lion on a kill or something like that, or hyenas is another thing. These white back vultures, they can get a wingspan of up to about 2.4 meters. Nice big gliding wings. Like your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 vultures that are flying around above us. All looking for a nice meal. They're very important, they're the cleanup crew of the bush. Because uh, also if you find a, a, a naturally dead animal, other animals will come eat on it. It's a free, free, free meal, but when it gets to a certain point, it gets too rotten, other animals can't handle it, lions, leopards, etc. Then you rely on the vultures and the hyenas to come clean up the bush. Oh, the thermal's gone, they're moving on to go find another thermal. There's some very, very high above us going. 
all over around. The whiteback vulture, if they arrive at a kill and the animal has died naturally, they, they have to go through whatever holes that are there. They eat the, the soft, fleshy bits. The, we have a bigger vulture called a leopard-faced vulture. It has the biggest bill out of all raptors. They've cut open animal hide. So when they get open, they cut open it, and they can make a easy access for other animals. I used to work in another small reserve that didn't have any predators on it. The odd, odd leopard would pass by, but uh, the um, residents that stayed in the area we didn't have. So if we find a dead animal, we wouldn't want it lying around. We would actually drag it out, and we had an area we called the vultures restaurant, a nice open area so with the vultures flying around, they could see it. And I'd seen where we'd take an impala, full carcass, you, you gut it, cut it down the middle so these guys can get in there. By the afternoon when you come back there, it's cleaned up. Now if they find something, they'll come land in the trees and wait until it's safe to eat. Because obviously being big birds, they can't just fly off quickly from the ground. They have to take a little run up. And if, if say, there's a lion or a leopard on a kill, they're going to try to kill the vulture because it's trying to steal their food. They'll wait until it's safe. So if you see the vultures on the ground eating, you know there's no other big predators probably around. They're right up above the circle. Uh, they want to go take a left down here. Go for take a left and see what we can find. Hey guys, it's been fun having you. I hope you enjoyed me. Go easy on me. It's my first time here. Yeah? Um, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to move on towards Brent. There's the old thumb man. And you guys are going to go back to Brent to the leopard. Jealous times. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Here he is, he hasn't moved much. Uh, he's probably going to move shortly, as you can see the shade is receding from where he is sleeping. And uh, probably doesn't look like he's going to climb the tree before the end of the safari this morning. I think he's going to doze in the shade. So he might move a little bit deeper into the shade behind him as the sun comes through. I think it's going to be a scorcher today. I think we might get over 30 degrees Celsius, but over 90 Fahrenheit, and this is winter still for us. Well, we are coming towards the end of winter. Hi, Bill, who's from the nursing home in Michigan. Bill is wondering, will Cindile share his kill with his mother? Uh, probably not now. I think. His mother will try to avoid him at all costs. The last time we saw them together, she physically attacked him aggressively, repeatedly. Uh, and she has had another cub. We're not sure whether she's lost that cub or not yet because she was seen mating with Tingana not so long ago. But she did the same thing when he was about the same age, just under a year. And she seems to have some very strange behavior uh, when it comes to cubs. But it's very, very unlikely that he would share this kill with his mother at the moment or mostly because if his mother caught wind of him, she would try to avoid him at all costs. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Stephen's wondering, how does a leopard's eyesight compare with human eyesight? Well, Stephen, I always remember, it's rods and cones. A leopard has more rods, so they see in, see in black and white, and uh, or sort of shades of grey, and they don't see detail like we do, so their eyes are designed to pick up movement, and that's why, oh, look who spotted the kill. He hasn't spotted, Cindy hasn't spotted, but I'm pretty sure that battalier and that glance over there might have spotted that piece of meat in the tree. Now let's see, we'll see if it comes back around for a second. Oh, there we go, he spotted the battalier as well, it popped his head up. And now look back down. So he'll be very conscious of any, specifically battaliers, tawny eagles, are another great thieves of leopard kills and trees. Uh, the problem with battaliers and tawny eagles is that they will uh, attract uh, the other vultures, the bigger species, the white-backed, lapid-faced, white-headed. Oh, sorry, I'm just talking about leopard eyesight. So they don't see detail, they see in sort of uh, a blurry black and white. Now that's the best type of eyesight to pick up any movement. So, and a lot of the predators... Oh, sorry, I can't see what's going on here. Um, it is very difficult in this light. He's just popped his head behind that stump. I'm just going to move forward slightly. So when Darby. Now watch, as soon as we move forward, he's going to pop his head back down. There we go. Okay. So that's the best type of eyesight to pick up movement. Lion, leopard, all have quite similar eyesight like that. And they're not, they don't really need to see colour. Uh, they're not fruit eaters. And if it moves, the general rule is you can eat it. So and the eyesight's very, very different from primate or human eyesight. Now, the one negative for young Sindile is where this kill is. Uh, it is in an area that Tingana likes to patrol through regularly. And old Mr. Tingana is a great wanderer, and he walks massive distances. He's got one of the largest territories for a male leopard in the Sabi Sands. Trying to see if that battalier is doing another swing over. Now, battaliers are one of the first birds to spot kills, generally before the vultures. He's looking to where that battalier flew off to. No, but I think he might have got lucky. I think that battalier might have missed it. All the battaliers playing coy. Wait for him to put his head down flat before sneaking in. But it has been an absolutely wonderful sunrise safari. Unfortunately, my dreams did not come true. And I didn't find any cheetah, even though I dreamed of cheetah last night. But I definitely will take young Sindile as a more than adequate supplement. So great to catch up with him. So great to see him looking so well. And I hope you guys enjoyed your time with Adam as well. And uh, shame, we'll let Adam come have a look at the leopard after drive. But I think young Sindile is going to schnooze for the next little while. So. While he schnoozes, we're going to leave him be. We'll definitely be back here on the sunset safari uh, to keep up with what's going on. Hopefully, he doesn't lose his kill to vultures or other leopards. But from a dangerous Dave, myself, and oopsie, rest of the Safari Live team, and of course, young Cindy Le, we bid you a fond adieu until this afternoon.